Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're talking about the divided Arab world. But first, let's see what Russians think about events playing out in that part of the world. Divisions in society, what will be the result? Bahrain has been paralyzed by protests focused on political reforms. The majority Shia country for nearly 250 years has been ruled by a Sunni minority. Many say protests in Bahrain are inspired by those in Tunisia and Egypt, but could there be a similar outcome since both Tunisia and Egypt are predominantly Sunni countries? The Russian Public Opinion Research Center asked citizens what is behind the uprisings in the Arab world. 45% say it's all because of low living standards. 14% blame long terms of rulers. 13% see authoritarianism at fault. Still, can religious divisions in the Arab world impact the cause of events developing in the region? Peter? Okay, Juan, if I can go to you and, and look at all the different layers that we have in play here. First of all, we have sectarian differences uh, being played uh, th that are on the ground, obviously, in the Arab world, in the, Arab, uh, in, in the greater Middle East. But, and then we have uh, different trends of uh, political forces occurring on the ground. We have, a po I guess all of us would agree, positive one of seeing changes in Egypt and in Tunisia, um, a reversal of fortune, to say the very least, in Libya. And now we have Saudi Arabia expressing um, its influence in the region. Which way? Is it going to go? How does it play into the sectarian difference, or is it just one more complicated layer on top of everything that's going on in what people are calling the, the Arab awakening? Well, I think the poll uh, uh, yielded the right results, which is the fact that Tunisia and Egypt are relatively uh, homogeneous societies. They're mostly Arab and Sunni. Uh, made it easier for their revolutions to succeed quickly because the elites in both countries weren't afraid that some other group uh, which had it in for them uh, would come to power uh, and marginalize them. One of the bad effects of the American invasion of Iraq in 2003 was that it was vindictive. The Sunni Arabs who had uh, been disproportionately in power in Iraq uh, before 2003 in the Ba'ath Party were targeted. Uh, they, they were fired in the tens and uh, thousands from their jobs. Uh, their their state-owned uh, factories and enterprises were dissolved. They were reduced to the lowest of low, and uh, the Shiites were brought in to replace them in those jobs and uh, ultimately took over uh, the main levers of power. Well, having seen that, uh, most Sunni regimes in the region that have a substantial Shiite population are now afraid of the Shiites, uh, and that's certainly the case in Bahrain. I think what happened in Iraq con helped to convince the Sunni monarchy to dig in its heels and not risk having a, a Shiite majority legislate uh, in the Bahrain legislature. Uh, so there is this divide, but if you look carefully, Although the overthrow of Saddam and the rise of a Shiite government in Iraq gave a lot of hope to Shiite communities throughout the Arab world, in every case, what they say they want and the way that they have mobilized is for a better deal economically and also politically in their own countries. So Hezbollah in Lebanon has played the role of a Lebanese political party, not, as a, not a transnational one. With Fak in Bahrain, it wants more jobs for Shiites mm -hmm. as well as uh, a better uh, deal uh, with regard to constitutional arrangements. The same thing in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia. In each case, it's a national demand for, for a better place at the national table. Okay, uh, Isham, in, in, uh, in Cairo, but it's not always being played out that way. I think what Juan has to say is very interesting is that we, we're going to see uh, in the next few hours, few days and weeks, obviously, how Iran is going to play uh, this card because uh, as many would say the, the Saudi intervention has actually opened the door for what people would call Iranian meddling um, in the, their backyard. And, and there was this agreement somehow that Bahrain would stay kind of neutral, stay in the middle, it wouldn't be contested. A lot of people are saying now the Saudis have opened the door for more contests. What do you think about that? Well, this is something that people in Bahrain and out of Bahrain, but linked to the Bahraini opposition, are now saying quite openly that 
the Saudi intervention does open that sort of door. But I, I still feel that we're not being cautious enough about playing out the sectarian aspect of this. Within Bahrain at the moment, it's not simply a Sunni bloc unified against a Shia bloc unified. It's much more complicated and complex than that. And even now, the, the way that the protests have been going on over the past few weeks, they did up the ante in the last week, uh, mar uh, trying to march against the, the royal palace, for example, blocking the roads, which meant that around 80 percent of Bahrainis couldn't go to work. This actually turned uh, a lot of public opinion within Bahrain, in, in, which went beyond the Sunni population, against uh, supporting the protesters with, you know, 100 percent of their favor. Uh, it's a very complex sort of situation. Even on the ground in Bahrain, uh, a country that I visited a number of times and which I'm, uh, I'm quite hopeful for for the future, uh, within Bahrain, the sectarianness, as we might describe it, isn't pronounced on the ground level between people. Do th um, but do you think it will be now? Do you think it will be now? Will will it be now become more discreet because of the incursion? I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think within Bahrain it will be. I do think that in the region as a whole and the relationship between Bahrain and the rest of the region and the uh, perceptions of uh, normal Bahrainis to the rest of the region, I think that will be affected quite strongly. I don't think, and I hope that within Bahrain itself that kind of sectarian attitude won't go through the roof. What do you think about that, Stephen? I mean, we uh, did uh, um, Saudi Arabia's actions open the door for more um, Iranian influence in the backyard of the Saudis? Well, there are two things that I think are being uh, neglected in, in, in general discussion of this. First is that Bakrin has been a kind of safety valve for Saudis who go across the causeway to do normal things like uh, in Bakrin women can drive cars, they're not forced to wear a uh, by in Niqab and so forth. And Saudi Arabia is concerned that a democratizing process in Bahrain could be contagious and especially towards the Shias in the eastern province. Um, the second thing is, it is, in my view, true that the new Arab revolt is essentially about economics and it's about the snapping of the weak links in the global system of economic power. And the, the problem for me is that the democratizing wave, the process of democratization that we saw beginning in Tunisia, has now encountered two very serious obstacles. The first, the rampant bloodshed in Libya, which is a terrible disincentive for anybody in the, in the Arab world to uh, launch any kind of uh, uh, democratization movement. And second, now we have the specter that a, a, a democratization movement can dissolve into a sectarian conflict, as happened in Iraq. So both of these will now be obstacles to the broadening of the democratization movement or the new Arab revolt or whatever we want to call it. I think it's, it, it was unfortunate that Saudi Arabia did this, and I think it will be interesting to find out, because Saudi is a more open society than it was in the past, it will be interesting to see how this plays out in Saudi political commentary, uh, in the, as far as the internal conflicts in the uh, Saudi royal circles and so forth. Because uh, this is basically an uh, economically based and politically based phenomenon. Go ahead, jump in. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, something, something that I've been observing from my vantage point within the region is that the, the reaction from most Arabs in the region to the Saudi incursion into Bahrain was, so Saudi Arabia and other GCs countries will intervene in Bahrain in what is essentially a domestic dispute, but they won't send troops to Libya. And that's a feeling that I think is very pronounced amongst many, many people in this region, that while Gaddafi is attacking his own people, the Arabs will not send troops in order to help, but they will send troops in Bahrain. It's very interesting. Why that's, something that the Libyans will, that's something the Libyans will not forget, mm. and I don't think it's something the public opinion in this region will forget either. Juan, I'd like to go to you. It's, it's a tangent that we just heard here. The Americans must somehow just be relieved. I mean, they have a huge um, uh, naval base on the, on, Bahrain, on the island itself. They must be relieved that it's at least protected, okay? And that, well, their Saudis are allies with the United States anyway. I mean, behind closed doors, a little bit of relief because the United States has been caught so flat-footed in the, in the Arab world over the last few months that maybe this one they got it right, huh? They're allies. Well, it's, of course, one doesn't know what's going on behind closed doors, but what the Americans are saying publicly uh, is not that they're happy about what's happened in Bahrain. In fact, uh, they seem to have been urging the king of Bahrain, in fact, to take 
uh, steps towards becoming more of a constitutional monarchy, uh, meeting some of the demands of the Shia majority. And I think Hillary Clinton and uh, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Bob Gates uh, have a theory of this thing that uh, the Shia majority in Bahrain needs uh, more of a safety valve. It needs to move the country towards more of a constitutional monarchy precisely in order to uh, assure future stability and assure uh, the functioning of that uh, uh, naval base, the headquarters of the Fifth Fleet uh, in, in the Gulf. And I think they're afraid that the movement towards polarization, uh, the sending of foreign troops into the country, the crushing, as we have seen uh, today, Thursday, of, of the protesters uh, at uh, the Pearl Roundabout, the uh, besieging of hospitals, the arrest of, uh, of even moderate uh, opposition leaders, that this uh, process of repression is going to polarize things uh, and is going to assure instability into the near and medium term, and that's what's bad for the American geopolitical position uh, in the Gulf. Okay, Stephen, I'm going to give you the last word on this program. Um, are the Saudis going to regret this move? I think everybody in the Arab and Muslim world is going to end up seeing this as having been uh, either a mistake if it slows down the democratization process in the new Arab revolt or uh, an opportunity that could end up because of the contagion of democratization having a positive effect in both Saudi Arabia or Iran, and Iran, but I think it's too early to tell. All right, gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. Many thanks to my guests today in Cairo, San Francisco, and in Ann Arbor, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, crosstalk rules.